So now, ladies and gentlemen, live and in colour, it's Mr. Wayne Love Juice. The other day I produced a movie Had a cat with an interesting happy We said that the YouTube algorithm Really are that happy If a channel only broadcasts once a week So we decided we could text ya Whenever we've got a piece of news In our new book on the track extra Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Downs, I'm director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology and presenter of these peculiar little shows which we put out on an increasingly regular basis. I'm sorry to lay a fairly sombre trip on you at the beginning of this episode but this time we need to say goodbye to several members of the CFZ extended family. First of all, I'd like to say goodbye to Carl's Auntie Linda. Quite simply, my Auntie Linda was wonderful. Um, ever since I can remember, um, she always, always had time for me. When I was little, one of my first memories was going down to Devon. Every morning when I would visit, as a child, she would always take me to the to the seaside, and we'd go before the sun came up, and uh, we would sit on this rock, and it kind of looked like a, a pirate ship, which entertained me no end when I was a child. And we would sit on this rock, and she would tell me about things that might be in the sea. They were sea serpents off the coast, and uh, if we sat there long enough, we might see them. We never did, funnily enough, but um, it made it interesting for me as a child. And, uh, and she was also very much into um, the paranormal. She took me to see a medium once, and. But amazingly enough, uh, the medium we went to see actually knew uh, about a weird dream I had. We were in a particularly dodgy area of Borneo and um, I was feeling quite nervous and I went to sleep and I had an unusual dream. It was a friend of mine called Daniel Sefton who died when he was 19, when well, I would have been 19 too, he died in a skiing accident. And uh, basically, in my dream, my, my, my lost friend came and told me that we might be in danger in this particular area and we should move. So me and Geordie just decided to move. And um, the medium knew about that, which I thought was pretty strange. And that was all to do with my Auntie Linda. When my auntie passed, her wish was that she would be cremated and put into a firework. She wanted to go out with something of a bang. And uh, that sums up her personality beautifully she was just like that like the fireworks she was a vibrant woman and i know that i shall miss her for the rest of my life And I'd also like to say goodbye to an old friend of mine, Tim Rundle, musician, artist, poet, and sometime member of both the Pink Fairies and the Deviants. I first met Tim through the good offices of the legendary Mick Farron, who is somebody who I miss daily because I was very fond of the old bugger and my life is truly not the same without him. It's going to be even less the same without Tim. Goodbye, old friend. But now I want to talk about crocodiles in Wales. Now, once again, I'd like to apologise to everybody for my appallingly crappy memory. But I know that there have been rumours and legends about there being crocodiles secreted in Welsh coal mines and other 
unlikely places for many, many years. And I believe that a dead crocodile was found in a Welsh coal mine something like 25 years ago. But for the life of me, I can't find the reference, I can't find the story. So if any of you can tell me when the Welsh coal mine crocodile happened, please put it in the comments below. This isn't sort of me being clickbaity to get you all to write in the comments below. It's actually because I have a stupid lack of memory and I really want to know the story. Because, as I'm just about to tell you, another legend about a dead crocodile in Wales has just proven to be true. Look at this. This is an Indo-Pacific crocodile dated to the 19th century which has been found underneath the floorboards of a school in Wales. The dead crocodile was found when builders lifted the floorboards of a Rhonda sign on tap school during renovation work. Until now, the story of a creature buried between Eastgall, Bondrigalt and Ristrud was long thought to be a myth. Now the legendary saltwater crocodile has pride of place in the school after more than two years of renovation. I'd heard a story that parents and school staff had buried a crocodile under the school sometime between the two world wars, head teacher Dr. Neil Pike said at the time, but I thought it was a myth and didn't take any notice until laid on the floor of the hall was the crocodile. The story goes that a local soldier brought the crocodile back from the First World War as a trophy gave it to the school and that the crocodile was initially put on display but then hidden beneath the floorboards to protect it from any damage during later times of conflict. That story really, at least to me, makes very little sense because I am sure that even the most impoverished school in Wales would have had more valuable items to hide from a possible Nazi invasion than a dead crocodile. When most people think of the First World War, they think of the horrible interminable conflict in Europe of trench warfare and the thousands and thousands of totally avoidable deaths. But, of course, it wasn't called a World War just because it was in Europe. It was called a world war because there was conflicts in many parts of the whole world. Here, for example, a map shows the spheres of influence before the war in the Pacific. And as you can see, there were sizable German colonies in New Guinea and some of the surrounding islands, including the Bismarck Archipelago which was is home to an island called New Britain, Lake Dakatawa of which held its very own monster stories some 30 years ago, although they actually turned out to be film that the Japanese film crew had taken by accident of two copulating crocodiles. But there were quite vicious spats of fighting in that area. But most of the Allied soldiers who threw the Germans out of New Guinea and New Britain and the Bismarck Archipelago, the Marianas Islands and all sorts of other bits and bobs were from Australia and New Zealand, not from the Welsh Valleys. So how did a Welsh soldier come across a dead Indo-Pacific crocodile and bring it back to Britain as a war trophy? And the answer is, I really have no idea, because there was fighting in various parts of Asia and in parts of East Africa, but the only fighting in places where the Indo-Pacific crocodile is known to have lived, or to live today even, is in this part of the ocean near New Guinea and New Britain and the Bismarck Archipelago. And, oh, by the way, just in case you hadn't uh, picked up on that, the fact that the archipelago is known as the Bismarck Archipelago 
is evidence that it was once a German colonial possession, but I'm digressing as I so often do. I cannot find a single theatre of conflict in the First World War where a Welsh soldier was likely to have been stationed and where Indo-Pacific crocodiles are likely to have been found. I suppose that the story could be just an incredibly dull one, that the Welsh soldier was fighting in Flanders and on his way back stopped off at a junk shop in Brussels where he found a dead crocodile. I suppose this is always possible, but the fact that he made it sound and the whole story makes it sound like it was a war trophy makes the whole story far more confusing. So, once again, boys and girls, it's down to you. Can any of you find me any way and any plausible reason why a Welsh soldier would be in crocodile land back between 1914 and 1918? And you, if there's any of you out there watching this who come from or have good links to that part of Wales, please can you go and look into the story a bit more deeply for me i would be very very grateful now before we leave the story i want to say very very big sorries to everybody who is from wales or speaks welsh and who is totally offended by the way i am sure that i mispronounced the place names earlier i did use a how to pronounce things website on the internet which gave me a bit of an insight into what I should be calling them but I'm sure they're wrong so please forgive me. Now boys and girls here we are at the end of another episode well I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back on Saturday afternoon with the proper show but in seven days time round about Five o'clock on a Wednesday evening, we'll be back with another On The Track Extra. And here I do want to apologise again to everybody who missed the premiere of the first episode in the series. It's because I was busily doing something else and I completely forgot to send out the notifications or indeed to watch the premiere myself. So please forgive me. Hopefully these things will become more slick and more professional as time goes on. But until then, it's only a few more days till Saturday, so Saturday, 3 o'clock. On one side will be me, probably Archie and probably Lilith, and almost certainly V and Louis and various other people who come to join in the chat, and on the other side there's you. So you'll be seeing me and I'll be... Still confused, you V, haven't I? Seeing you.